Good evening, everyone. Welcome to LMU's special lecture series. My name is Yong Sun Pak. I'm a professor of international business and management and director of the Center for Asian Business and also the Center for International Business Education of Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by DK Kim Foundation, benefactor of the Center for Asian Business, as well as the cyber grants awarded by the US Department of Education. We'd like to thank our sponsors for their gracious support. Let me also recognize a couple of people helping me behind the scene. Dr. Marky Jones, Assistant Director of the Center, and Sarah Dixon, Technology Support Specialist. Dr. Jones will help me with the Q&A session later. I also would like to thank Jennifer Tyler, Administrative Coordinator of our Center, and Natalie Dreddick, CBA Communications Manager for their help promoting the event. Thanks to their efforts, we have more than 300 people registered for this webinar. Before we start the program, let me introduce the CBA Dean, Dr. Dale Smith. Dr. Dale, uh, Dr. Smith, can you please uh, say a few words to welcome everyone? Thank you, young son. On behalf of the College of Business Administration and LMU, our Center for International Business Education and the Center for Asian Business, I'm so pleased to be here and welcoming you to the DK Kim Lecture Series for a very special program tonight. As Dean of the College, we are just delighted that we're hosting Dr. Jennifer Bully, who holds the Tang Chair in China Policy Studies at the RAND Corporation. And I know that Dr. Peck will do a proper introduction, but for now, let me just say that the talk and our discussion tonight could not be more important as we talk about the coronavirus and the road to economic recovery. I also wanna add my thanks to the director, Young Sun Peck and Marky Jones, who've arranged tonight's lectures, as well as the people behind the scenes. So let me add my thanks there. And many of our CBA staff members who were also instrumental in providing the kinds of support required in virtual programming. And for that, I'm truly grateful. You know, upon my arrival last year at uh, LMU, our college set out to develop an aspirational vision on what we hoped would continue to contribute to educating this next generation and provide outreach to the community. But at that time, no one could have predicted that two major tenets of our mission statement, moral courage and creative confidence, would become the centerpiece of the skills and the abilities we need to use in attacking the pandemic and restoring the global community to a healthy state. We also set a task for ourselves to embrace responsible business education and committed to partnering with the United Nations to address sustainable development goals 17 goals that range from healthcare to economic security and everything in between. Despite these dark times, I have true confidence in the ability for people and countries having a positive impact on the world. And I firmly believe that business has to have a voice at that table if we as a global community have any chance of addressing the most significant challenges of our time including the coronavirus and rebuilding economies in sustainable and ethical ways. So tonight's speaker couldn't be more important or more timely. Providing programs like tonight's lecture is an important step in the mission and goals that we have here at LMU. Before I turn this back over to Young Sun Peck, let me just say it has been quite a start to 2020, which I'm sure all of you here can agree to. It has certainly been a test of our entrepreneurial mindset and skill sets as we've had to pivot on the fly during this pandemic. For many, that may result in feelings of learned helplessness, yet our ability to be inspired, to find inner strength and use that moral courage for ethical and sustainable decision-making, problem-solving, and seeking those new opportunities to address significant challenges is the hallmark of what we do here at LMU and in the CBA. So as we come together to hear from thought leaders like Dr. Bowie, we have opportunities to take these insights and make a difference. Knowledge gives you that strength. So thank you all for being here, for coming into this webinar. Stay healthy and safe, and what we call around here, CBA Strong. We really truly are in this together, and I look forward to tonight's program. Back to you, Dr. Peck. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your introduction of the CBA mission, goals, and welcoming remarks. We prepared this webinar to help you better understand the COVID-19 and its impact on global supply chain and global economy. 
The coronavirus pandemic has affected various aspects of our life. It has substantially damaged our health, wealth, and well-being. As of today, the viral outbreak has infected over 3 million people around the world, including more than 1 million Americans, and took the lives of more than 200,000 around the world, including more than 60,000 in the US only, which is more than the number of Americans who died in the Vietnam War. But the true numbers are believed to be much higher. It is also changing how we live our daily lives. We are now living in a totally different world than before the crisis. Mr. Bill Gates predicted about five years ago that it would be this kind of deadly disease, not a war started by a nuclear weapon that would severely impact the global economy. Today, I have invited an expert who has conducted an extensive research on global health issues and thus can help us understand how we can avoid another pandemic in the, new, in the future and overcome the current health and economic crisis. I'm delighted to introduce our speaker, Dr. Jennifer Huang Bui. Dr. Bui is a senior policy researcher and tank chair for China policy studies at the Rand Corporation. In this capacity, she leads wide range of collaborative research initiatives on health, education, international relationship, and global developments. Since July 2019, Dr. Bui has been invited to provide four testimonies at the US Congress on US China collaborations on global health issues and also coronavirus impact on the global economy. Prior to joining RAND, Dr. Bui served as a global health professor for 14 years at Georgetown University. She holds a PhD degree in epidemiology from George Washington University and an MD from the Peking University School of Medicine in China. Dr. Bui, thank you so much for agreeing to talk to LMU community out of your very busy schedule. We originally planned your visit to LMU but unfortunately, the coronavirus situation has dramatically changed and we had to convert your lecture to webinar. I know you're actually preparing for another testimony at the Congress in May. As you have dual degrees, MD and also the PhD, I'd like to ask a few questions first related to health issues, and then we'll move to economic issues. Then Q&A session will follow after that. Audience, Please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to submit questions. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a brief survey. Dr. Bui, uh, here's my first question. The coronavirus outbreak is unprecedented in its scale and severity for humans. As I mentioned earlier, the US coronavirus death toll surpasses American fatalities from the Korean or Vietnam War. We are indeed at war against this virus. As an epidemiologist, can you please explain to us how the COVID-19 is different from previous coronaviruses such as SARS or MERS? Are there any sure. common misconceptions about this disease that need to be addressed? Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Peck, and also thanks to uh, Professor Dixon and uh, uh, Dr. Jones for inviting me here. I'm very excited to be in this uh, lecture series, very honored uh, to, uh, uh, you know, from my home to answer these questions. Uh, well, rarely would I see, think that uh, as an epidemiologist, I will be given a talk at a business school, but I guess this is unusual time. Uh, and I'm really happy to uh, hear from you and especially from your, uh, of your questions. So um, back to Professor Peck about your questions. Very good question, why COVID-19 out of blue caused such a, a pandemic? Uh, well, uh, I may want to now share some of my slides just to give you a, uh, more of a visual uh, scene of uh, 
of our statistics. So uh, SARS caused about 8,000 deaths, uh, 8,000 cases, about 700 deaths back in 2002 to 2003. It only, as you can see, only had like basically one wave of epidemic, whereas MERS uh, is another coronavirus that uh, emerged from Saudi Arabia in 2012 and lasted uh, all the way to now. But as you can see, they, uh, the MERS only caused uh, some very small, very limited regional uh, epidemic. Uh, nothing like uh, what we have seen in COVID-19 that within four or five months, it has spread to all six continents and over 200 countries. So why is that? So I use this chart often to explain the difference of these the, the differences in the virus. As we can see that the x-axis is the how contagious this virus can be and the y-axis here shows the fatality. So basically the severity of the, uh, the disease and the deaths that the virus can cause. As you can see, I put them into basically three buckets. Um, the, the green one is what we see uh, you know, swine flu, common cold. They are not so uh, contagious, uh, but they can cause uh, some uh, fatality, but not very high. So this bucket, usually we just use, uh, we call them endemic, uh, or, you know, uh, we use the uh, herd immunity to, uh, to suppress most of them. Uh, whereas MERS and SARS, these are the two other coronavirus, they compare to COVID-19, which is in this pink uh, uh, box, because we don't know exactly what is the case fatality yet. This is our uh, best guess for now. Uh, but uh, we can see that SARS caused 10% of deaths in, in these cases. MERS caused about 20% to 30% of the deaths. So these cases are actually more severe, cause more deaths. So most of the patients who got the disease will ended up in the hospital, but in a way it's actually limited uh, its spread. Whereas when we see the COVID-19 in this big purple pandemic group, uh, they have uh, more contagious than some of these uh, common virus, but also it doesn't cause uh, that much fatality. And as I can show you in the next slides, in terms of clinical symptoms, the first week of uh, uh, the most of the symptoms are very mild, very similar to cold, uh, a, a, you know, a common cold or flu. Uh, and then it's only until second week that 20% of the patients develop serious uh, problems. And we also know that the incubation period uh, can be long. Uh, and also there might be a, a substantial proportion of asymptomatic cases. So I think it's these characteristic of the clinical symptoms and the virus that cause uh, the, this unprecedented fast spread um, in, the, in the world. Uh, let me see if I can, uh, you know, usually as epidemiologists, we look at every epidemic as uh, looking at the agent, that's the virus, the host, uh, which is the population, uh, since it's a new virus, novel virus, no one has immunity. And then we also look at the environment, uh, which where, you know, the agent meets the, the host. Um, and certainly there are, we have seen a lot of uh, new scientific uh, reports coming out every day. We still have a lot of questions about the, the virus, about the immunity, and about the type of environment uh, this can, uh, that's associated with COVID-19. But I'm sure, you know, I, I will wait for more questions later, but I'm just showing you that it's, uh, there are lots of research done on this, but there's still a lot of uh, mysteries there. All right, so let me stop, share, and go back to you. I think you're muted, Professor Pat. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for your answer. That really helped us understand better the difference between this COVID-19 and two previous uh, coronavirus. I remember the U.S. came through these previous global epidemics, SARS or MERS, pretty much unscathed, unlike the countries in Asia and Middle East where infected cases were much higher. 
So they may have learned how to cope with coronavirus from these previous experiences. Um, that leads to my actually next question. Uh, though my next question is uh, medical experts believe that there are four key elements that need to be under control in order to contain and combat this deadly virus. First one is testing, then PPE, uh, personal protective equipment, such as face masks and gowns, contact tracing or tracking, and finally data collection. Maybe it has to do with these factors that countries like Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea were able to control the coronavirus pandemic better than other countries. Can you please give us a comparative analysis of how the US versus these countries addressed each of these areas in their handling of the crisis? And if there's anything we can learn from their experience? Sure, uh, let me continue uh, to the next slides. So this uh, chart uh, probably address some of the phenomena you just uh, mentioned. Uh, we do see very uh, different countries using very different policies uh, and maybe partly due to their experience with pandemics and crisis management. Uh, so this chart showing that basically two, three buckets, uh, three different types of uh, countries reactions. And as you can see, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, uh, even you know, China in the second half of its management are doing quite well. Uh, in some Pacific uh, uh, countries are also doing quite well, but most of the US and European countries uh, are in this uh, darker blue uh, area where you see that testing number are just not uh, on par and their, their case number are much higher. And then we also see a small, uh, uh, another group of the, we call it um, more like a black box. Uh, those are the countries that has yet to, to raise, increase their testing. So uh, their, their number might be low, but it, it could be uh, due to the, the limited testing so, so far. So uh, as we can see, let me see this. China has done uh, quite a, a good job containing the virus, even though at the very beginning of the, the epidemic, uh, since the, virus, the COVID come up uh, in December in China, uh, there were some chaotic uh, and some cover up there. So it missed a couple of weeks of very critical time uh, right before the Chinese New Year, uh, when uh, the China CDC didn't confirm there's a person-to-person -person, uh, transmission. But once it's uh, confirmed that they pretty much within days uh, announced a public health emergency and locked down the, the Wuhan city, uh, and then assumed uh, that lockdown spread to 16 cities uh, in that province. And during the Chinese New Year, pretty much the whole country is locked down. So China's uh, strategy is really uh, a very uh, severe lockdown, as you can see in, in late January. And then within three or four weeks uh, that they, uh, uh, the epidemic peaked. And then the blue line here shows the, the, the testing. As you can see, the testing uh, capacity is uh, not uh, very good in the in the uh, in the first uh, few weeks, but then it quickly catched up in um, caught up in the later in the February, and then that's they coincide with the the decrease of the cases, uh, and then uh, till now you can see that there's a little bit more cases in March due to the imported cases, but otherwise they pretty much contain uh, the the COVID nineteen uh, epidemic. South Korea probably has done the best. Um, as you can see, their testing rate is over, always higher uh, than their case numbers. That means they never encountered a shortage of testing from very beginning. So maybe that's why from very early on, they have a good control of the epidemic. It peaked in, in late February uh, and then coming down uh, quickly and maintained very low. Even though you know they had the election uh, last week, even that uh, type of events didn't really raise any uh, alert, uh, new epidemic. Uh, so they're using the testing, tracing, uh, and uh, treatment, those three T uh, strategy as their uh, coherent uh, national policies. And especially they focus um, 
other than the testing, uh, widespread testing, they also use a very uh, aggressive tracing uh, policies and uh, apps. So that helped. And then if we look at uh, US, uh, this is US, and we can certainly see that uh, the testing goes very slow uh, all the way to March after you know, the US has witnessed the outbreaks in, in, the, in Asia and uh, then the outbreaks in Europe. Uh, but still, uh, US was not uh, ready until very late uh, March. Even till this day, we're still talking about shortage of testing. So I guess that's uh, the biggest issue. And certainly now, US has one third of the cases in the world. So if you look at this chart showing after the first 100 days, how the uh, first 100 uh, cases, how the epidemic uh, evolves, you will see that Korea pretty much uh, contained uh, the case number. And China did not as well as Korea. But US certainly is going upwards. Uh, still so far. So I um, uh, summarized uh, some of the successful uh, uh, response to COVID as uh, T, uh, T-A. T means there has to be a transparency, coherent uh, government policy. Uh, there should be a standard uh, operation plan. Uh, that, so that's the T. And then there should be a fast and effective uh, in decision making, mobilize the resources uh, in the country to focus on the testing and tracing. So that's E. And agility uh, means that uh, we have to, the, the government need to monitor the patterns of diseases and quickly changing its uh, strategy if the previous strategy didn't work. We see this in Singapore, who at the very beginning done a very good job in containing the, the uh, virus epidemic. But later on, uh, there's actually a, a outbreak of uh, COVID among the foreign worker uh, dorms. So, but the, at least the, the government uh, realized that very quickly and, and uh, is doing uh, very um, uh, effective ways to mobilize the resources to help that community. So agility is uh, very important too. So here I listed some of the uh, um, requirements. So maybe I can st stop there, yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Well, thanks for your answer. And I think in your tea model, and certainly that the, the you know, China is doing tea rather than coffee, uh, sounds very interesting. Uh, in terms of agility, I think South Korea, as you said, presents a very good example. South Korea pioneered the coronavirus drive-through testing station. Health workers in South Korea were inspired to replicate successful business models of Starbucks and McDonald's who have introduced drive-through service. It is safer and faster to test for the virus than in a hospital. And obviously you can test a much larger or the bigger number of people that way. That might explain why the, uh, South Korea was able to control this disease uh, rather effectively. Okay, I'll move to the next question. Many countries have enforced lockdowns to control the rapid spread of coronavirus, paying the enormous price in terms of economic pain. There was an increasing pressure to relax or lift coronavirus lockdown measures to save jobs and economies. In the US, President Trump gave governors options to how to reopen their economy. The new guidelines are prepared to ease restrictions in those areas with low transmission of the coronavirus while holding the line in hotspots such as New York and California. Last week, California Governor Newsom announced a roadmap to modify the stay at home order. What do you think should be the key criteria to be met before reopening the economy and when do you expect this will happen? Great. Um, so let me share more slides. Uh, okay. Um, so talk about uh, reopening. Uh, we know that right now for this new novel virus, we do not have a vaccine. And we don't expect uh, most people can have access to an effective vaccine for at least a year. And we don't even have a uh, effective treatment yet. Uh, so there's a lot of unknown in the clinical world. So what can we do in this uh, circumstances? Um, so 
basically what we have is public health intervention and we call them non-pharmaceutical interventions. And there are different types of these interventions. Uh, I put them into general, you know, two buckets. Uh, one is what we have seen in the US, basically it's a community closed down. Uh, this way, you know, we can quickly reduce the contact mix and stop the transmission. Usually it's very effective when there's already a, a widespread community uh, uh, transmission. You don't see this in, in Korea or Hong Kong um, because they don't really have a widespread community um, transmission yet, but we do have that here. Uh, and so that's why we see all these closing of schools, closing of business. Uh, the problem with this is certainly that it has a huge uh, price in the economy and the social uh, social life. Um, so to convert to the second mode, which is also MPI, but these are wearing facial ma uh, face masks, um, hand uh, uh, sanitation and disinfect. So these are uh, measures are still probably will be the new norm uh, as long as we don't have the vaccine. But these new norms at least will allow the co economy to continue. So from one to the second, uh, what we need is that at least we need to see the COVID cases coming down consistently for at least a week or two weeks. Uh, that means the transmission has been stopped. That's not what we have seen so far in, in most of the, the country. And we also need to uh, be careful to see whether the caseload can be handled by the local healthcare capacity. So as you can see, this can be different from region to region. But uh, even if we have these two criteria met, we have to uh, use what we call now is a boxing uh, strategy to have testing uh, wide open uh, and wide available so that whoever has suspicions of uh, the, the symptoms can get a test. And once you have the test, they, they have to have a mechanism of uh, tra case tracing and isolating those who are infected. Um, and then uh, self-quarantine those who are infected for at least 14 days. Or you know, in some, some country, they don't even uh, trust self-quarantine. They will require a, a clinic or a field hospital to house these uh, uh, mild symptoms uh, uh, patients. You know, uh, there's really uh, not very complex to stop an epidemic. As long as you can separate the healthy versus those who are infected, then that's the way to do. Uh, but um, given that COVID is highly contagious and there might be asymptomatic cases, this uh, becoming more challenging. Shall we just stop here and uh, move on? I do have a few slides on you know, how to gradually open the, uh, the different sectors and uh, an example of uh, China that using five different stages uh, of uh, 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 policies to guide uh, the reopening. Uh, you know, I think they are very much afraid of another outbreak. So they're being very uh, careful in open up uh, gradually. I see. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, it sounds like we still have a long way to go um, before that uh, we actually go back to either normal or new normal. I understand that people's patience is running a uh, theme uh, as the lockdown has been extended um, uh, through mid-May in, in California. Now, I'd like to ask a few questions related to economic issues. Global as well as local economies in many countries have been devastated by this health crisis. The IMF expects the global economy to contract by 3% this year. I think that's a very optimistic prediction. The US GDP is expected to drop in the second quarter by a 40% annual rate. Tens of millions of workers have already lost their jobs and more people fear they will be next. Most countries are using an enormous stimulus package to save their economy, but in some countries, public debt to GDP ratio is already very high and they don't seem to have much room to maneuver. Personally, I think it is very unlikely to see a so-called V-shaped or U-shaped recovery even after the coronavirus outbreak has subsided. What the economic recovery will look like and what would be appropriate strategies to regain momentum? 
So uh, again, I think uh, it's for me, it's more straightforward to talk about how to stop an epidemic uh, than uh, when we're coming to the e economic issues. But I want to mention something that uh, in the last three weeks at RAND, we're doing a COVID-19 speaker series uh, where we invited uh, ambassadors and uh, consul generals from eight countries from Asia to talk about their experience. Uh, that include some of these East Asian countries that are doing very successfully on containing the virus and, and those countries like India and Pakistan are just seeing the uh, epidemic emerge. But pretty much every single country, no matter whether they are uh, feeling good about the, the epidemic or not, they are all talking about the problems with the economy. Uh, and every country is putting in stimulus uh, plans to, to help uh, the low income and the retail sectors. Um, and then when we asked them, you know, what about the debts, you know, uh, and every one of them were talking, saying, you know, now this is the big fire that we want to put off. We have to uh, do this first. So let me, with that, share a couple of slides showing some of the economic uh, impacts. So this is showing that in the first quarter in China, as we can see in different sectors, primary that's agriculture, uh, industry and the service, uh, all across the board, there's a, a, a you know a, a reduction in productivity. And then uh, the manufacturing, factory, uh, the construction, all of these sectors are are uh, hurt. And uh, uh, the transport, the travel and uh, hospitality industry certainly hurt the most. And then, but even you look at all these different uh, groups in, in, in countries in China, even with these countries that are doing quite well with uh, epi uh, uh, epidem epidemiology uh, patterns, uh, they are still uh, suffering this hurt. That's because uh, now our uh, economy is such a global uh, phenomena uh, based on the, uh, the market demands as well as the supply chain. So. I think this is another uh, case that we have to see uh, the epidemic need to be, uh, we have to form a coalition to fight the epidemic first, because if we have some country doing well, but other, not other countries, we still cannot help uh, to save our livelihood. Um, and then this is uh, uh, some of the prediction of the, uh, the annual GDP of uh, the United States, we're talking about the worst scenario for the post Second World War. Um, and then there are some estimates to, to say, well, if we can contain the virus well, uh, then maybe, you know, even though the Europe and uh, US is a little bit later, in quarter two, they hit the bottom, maybe it can come back um, by the quarter, uh, the fourth quarter. But more pessimistic uh, estimates is that if we don't see a good control of the uh, transmission of the epidemic, we're more likely to see the market demand is very slow. The supply chain was uh, becoming more of a problem. And uh, the when we hit the bottom in quarter two and quarter three, we will see a very gradual, very slow recover. Yeah. So my sense is, you know, uh, talk about economic uh, recovery, we, we still have the first have the resolution to stop this transmission. Otherwise, even if we open up, um, people will still be afraid of going out, will be afraid to go to work, and they will be afraid to go to restaurants. And that would not help the economy. Yeah. Well, obviously this what the uh, health crisis is completely tied to the economic crisis. So, and the world economy, as you said, it all integrated. So even though that the, you know, certain country come out of this uh, crisis, rather quickly, uh, but still that uh, uh, the other countries are not doing that, uh, certainly that uh, that's not gonna help the global economy. And I heard that China's economy has recovered uh, right now already about 60%, but it will be a while before we see the comeback of the US economy. Uh, my next question is about global supply chain. Starting from China, global supply chain has been seriously disrupted due to the coronavirus crisis. I understand you have some data to share with us to illustrate how damaging it has been to the global economy. Companies would surely revisit their strategies. So 
sorry. Um, uh, companies will surely revisit their strategies on sourcing raw materials, sub-assemblies, or finished products. Can you please give us insight into risk mitigation strategies for securing adequate amounts of goods and services, including medical supplies? Yes, uh, well, certainly I can tell you that the sentiment in China uh, back in the February, everyone's worried that uh, if uh, China cannot reopen its uh, manufacturing sector, then the global supply chain will be in serious problems. This chart shows that uh, certainly China in many different sectors, uh, especially on computer electronics and uh, uh, minerals, uh, they are the main uh, uh, producer uh, in the world. Uh, but interestingly, that uh, that was also a problem you know, the, the uh, dilemma and challenge that Chinese government was facing then. So they quickly tried to open up the, the factories uh, in, uh, and set up in regulations uh, to, and they, in, in some circumstances, they even sent uh, flights to get the migrant worker back to, to the factory. But then in March, what they found is even when most of the factories are open, at least uh, they're open, it may not be on the full uh, production power yet, uh, but they found, you know, the, uh, they, the, what they face then, the difficulty is that the, uh, the uh, dramatic drop of the market demand. Now they're facing the situation then uh, when the, fa the workers are in the factories, but they have no orders. Uh, they have canceled orders. So that shows how this uh, COVID uh, deal with the, um, um, the, uh, the, the supply chain as well as the global economy. And talk about the pharmaceuticals. Here I show one uh, slide just showing you know, different types of uh, inventories that for different sectors. As you can see that actually for most of the pharmaceuticals, uh, the inventories for different, most of the countries are pretty high. So we have talked about the China mostly provide APIs, uh, the active uh, pharmaceutical ingredients for the world. They, uh, probably export about 80% uh, of the world uh, demands for that. But it's not directly coming to the US. It's usually going to, the, uh, to uh, India. Uh, and then India used those APIs to, create, to make the generic drugs and then uh, export to the US and other parts of the world. Uh, and then uh, because the, the COVID hit at the time at the Chinese New Year's, uh, most of the uh, customers uh, know that China will stop uh, production for a couple of weeks. So they do have a uh, some kind of a stop uh, inventory uh, then. Uh, so India was talking about they have three months of uh, stock of APIs. So what we have seen now, as long as China opens uh, their in, uh, manufacturing industry this month, then there shouldn't be a huge problem uh, in the basic mater material. But then, uh, as we can see, the, when COVID spread to other countries, it definitely becomes much more uh, complicated. And in terms of supply chain, we, sh we are looking at not just the supplier, the upstream supplier net network, but also the logistic. Uh, the maritime shipping has been slowed down dramatically uh, in February. January and February, and, and that can take uh, months to, to recover. But also in terms, uh, we have to think about uh, the financial, how much uh, uh, cash flow we can maintain, and also whether the pr product uh, complicity, that, that does it really need a sp very specific product, or can there be a supplement uh, that's used in the production? So all of these factors will affect a company's uh, consideration of supply chain. Okay, thank you. Um, I certainly expect that global supply chain strategy for many companies that, that the way they manage will change. Um, given the amount of time, let me get to the very last question before we take questions from the audience. Uh, some pundits argue that protectionism will intensify in efforts to safeguard one's own country and people from the rest of the world in the aftermath of coronavirus crisis. But I would argue global trade and cooperation is more important than ever before in order for us to work together to control this kind of disease. 
Just like many other global issues, such as climate change and poverty, we are all fighting against a common problem. What should we learn from this experience in order to prevent the second wave of the coronavirus pandemic and save the global economy from another deep recession? As an expert on China policy studies, how do you expect the current situation will affect the US-China relationship, including trade dispute? Dr. Bui? Okay, okay, I can unmute myself. Uh, yes, that's a great question. Uh, as we can see in Hong Kong, uh, cases of Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, they actually, uh, and including Taiwan, uh, they see a second wave of uh, imported cases after they have already contained the virus quite well. Uh, so this shows that if we don't have a global control of the uh, pandemic, uh, no country is safe on its own. But unfortunately, I think when we're facing this unprecedented crisis, uh, a lot of the policymakers are, uh, you know, given into their uh, country uh, domestic uh, politics. Uh, so that's what I've seen in both U.S. and China. Some of the rhetoric uh, in terms uh, given uh, talking about the collaboration and uh, also on WHO is really driven by the uh, domestic uh, politics uh, and maybe probably relates to the election uh, and to you know some of the the, the insecurity of the government uh, officials feels so this reflects that in the US they attack uh, you know blaming uh, uh, other countries uh, for the, the source of the, the uh, epidemic and also reflect in China that uh, trying very aggressively to do some mask uh, uh, diplomacy, but in a way maybe try to uh, reduce the damage uh, of their global image um, uh, due to their early uh, delays. Uh, so I do hope that our countries can really look at long term and looking at, at the global impact of this epidemic and, uh, you know, go past these domestic issues and then think about the long term making history rather than uh, not just to make the headlines. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Boy. Uh, we have about, let's see, about 11 minutes left uh, before wrapping up the webinar. Now I'd like to take some questions from the audience. Uh, can I ask Dr. Jones to read some questions? I saw seven questions posted and received from the audience. Thank you, Dr. Bui. I have a question here that says, did South Korea, China, Hong Kong test everyone in order to follow the three T's? Is it required to test everyone in the US to follow the three T's? That's a great question. No, I don't think they are uh, doing uh, uh, population-based uh, testing yet. Uh, even though in the last few days, last uh, week, uh, we have seen in Guangzhou and Shanghai, uh, they, the China is trying to uh, test all the taxi drivers. They test all the, uh, the school workers uh, in preparation of, uh, 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 you know, reopening. Uh, but uh, it may not be, you know, the most efficient. I know they have uh, tested tens of thousands and maybe got 100 uh, or, or 180 um, and positive cases. Uh, in, in Korea, they also, I don't think they did, what they did is uh, population-wide testing, but what they do is they set up these tents and whoever has any uh, contact with a uh, confirmed case or whoever has a similar uh, symptoms, they can go to these uh, uh, testing place to test. And then they also have a really good case tracing system. So whoever who tests a positive, and then the government will have, they have actually have a public health law that the government can use the data from this uh, person's uh, credit card and then trace back to a couple of days of where this person have been. And then this, uh, disseminate that information through these apps so that people would know, okay, so this supermarket, uh, there was a, a positive infected person being into this supermarket, maybe we should avoid that for a few days. Uh, so things like that uh, can really help uh, to uh, uh, isolate the infected from the, um, the, the healthy. So the 3T 
uh, doesn't really need a, a comprehensive population-wide testing, but it should be enough testing so that everyone wants to take a test can, do, can have a test. And by the way, Singapore also made an effort here. They um, encourage people to, who has the flu symptoms to go to their fever clinic for testing. They even uh, you know, cut the price in half to ask people you know, to go to the clinic. Uh, once they have any symptoms. Thank you. The next question is, when states take different strategies within the US, what are the implications? Would the good work of containment in one state be compromised by states who take a different strategy? That can be the case. Uh, as we say, you know, between countries, we see that some countries contain better, but then the imported case can uh, very well start another wave. So I would say if uh, US has very dramatic different uh, approach by state, then maybe the next question is uh, whether there will be some uh, uh, you know, travel quarantine requirement uh, for different states. Uh, but I think you know, once we get there, uh, if one state is getting uh, uh, really have the virus contained, that will probably will be the second step to think about the travel uh, quarantines. Thank you. The next question, what issues and concerns are there if COVID-19 returns during the winter 2020-21 flu season? Right, there are lots of concerns about whether the second, well, you know, when the virus coming back in the fall, uh, combined with the flu season, what, the, what would be the situation? I think it, it is a legitimate uh, concern uh, because I don't think this virus will be go away uh, for the rest of the year. Uh, so the idea is if we could have a effective containment uh, strategy, uh, then at least it would not overburden the healthcare system that much. If we don't do that, uh, then the combined uh, epidemic of flu and COVID-19 and really break uh, our healthcare system. And what we'll see is excessive uh, mortality and mor mor morbidity uh, because this will uh, affect not just the uh, COVID or flu patient, it will also uh, cut the, the healthcare services for cancer patients, you know, for trauma patients. So that will be a disaster uh, scenario. Thank you. The next question is, is herd immunity even possible with COVID-19, given that there are 17 plus mutations so far? And uh, asked differently, will COVID-19 over time become like seasonal flu, where the virus itself mutates and still causes disease and death? So uh, there are many uh, labs and scientists uh, monitoring very closely uh, of the COVID-19 uh, virus. So I think that's one contribution from the scientists uh, from Asia and especially from China who provide the genomic uh, information very early on uh, in the uh, epidemic. They found this coronavirus, like uh, similar to other coronavirus, uh, is actually not mutating very fast. Uh, the average rate is two mutations uh, per uh, uh, two mutations per month. Uh, so this is out of uh, 30,000 uh, sites that can have, uh, prompt this mutation. So that's relatively a stable uh, uh, drift. Um, but whether that will hurt the uh, uh, effects or hurt uh, immunity, I think herd immunity really, if we talk about natural herd immunity, that means probably half of the the U.S. population will have to be uh, affected, and then you know we say uh, three percent uh, mortality rate. That would be a very high toll on the, uh, you know, uh, for this country. I still hope you know we won't get there uh, before uh, the vaccine comes up, uh, and hope, hope hopefully the vaccine can pr uh, protect us and protect the most of the uh, people in the U.S. If I may, uh, you know, Sweden uh, took a completely different approach, right? That you talk about herd immunity. We don't know the results, but uh, it looks very interesting. So what is your perspective about that, their approach? There are debates on that. Um, 
but I, you know, um, I, my thought is that if we don't have, uh, since we now we don't know how many people have uh, infected, uh, but with no symptoms. So there's a big unknown is asymptomatic cases. If we say, you know, we have the asymptomatic uh, cases as many as those symptomatic, that means we only capture half of the, the cases and the other half uh, is already there. Uh, then, you know, and if we assume this immunity can last uh, for a few months or for a year, then maybe, you know, herd immunity could be a strategy. But, but I still think that's a very risky and very high price on human lives. Yeah. And it would take a, lot, a while to get there. Uh, so the economy would not be uh, good either. Okay, maybe we have uh, one more question, right? Uh, time for one more question. Okay. Um, Dr. Bui, you use the phrase cover up to describe the initial missteps in China to manage this virus. It is clear to anyone paying attention that this event phenomenon is being used for political purposes by all parties and all countries and all media. That is, we are being given information that supports a particular agenda and these dueling agendas result in multiple competing messages being constantly fed to the public. How would we as citizens ever feel confident that we are getting accurate information? Clearly, we are just expected to trust our government's decisions, but it should be obvious that even the different components of the governments have vastly different messages and agendas. That's a great question. Uh, so that's why I think in my uh, tea therapy, <laughs> the TA, uh, the first thing first is transparency. Uh, if we look at a country that has done a su successful job, that it's invariably, it's always have a good communication between uh, the government and the public and the public can provide the support uh, to the government's uh, decisions. And we see that in Korea, we see that in New Zealand, uh, we see that in Singapore. Uh, so I would say pr uh, tra transparency is one of the, uh, the, the baseline, the, the most important uh, uh, thing that we want to maintain. Um, you know, unfortunately in, in the US, uh, there still we hear the rhetoric from different uh, political uh, views. Uh, so to get a political gains, that's very unfortunate. I, I still hope that the, uh, the country's leadership should really focus on the uh, fighting the, the pandemic uh, rather than uh, fighting each other. Well, uh, you mentioned, um, you know, South Korea is one of the uh, the good example, but uh, I'm not sure whether the U.S. can adopt that kind of system. I mean, there's an issue with the privacy, right? Uh, people is not going to feel comfortable with that the government has all this kind of information, you know, where you use the credit card and then um, where you had a dinner and, and et cetera. So I know that uh, we are running out of time, but, uh, you know, the strategy that worked in one place, it may not work in, in other places and vice versa. That's true. And uh, uh, for, for South Korea, they actually passed a public health law after Mar uh, MERS uh, that the, the public has agreed uh, that the government can uh, take the, the data. So that's a very different uh, dynamic, mm -hmm. right? Um, Unfortunately, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, Dr. Bui, uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and insights with us about this important issue today. Your presentation was very insightful and enlightening. I also would like to thank all of you who joined the webinar today. I hope you have enjoyed the program. We'll be back with another program in fall. Please stay safe and healthy until then. Before you leave, please complete a short survey at the end of this webinar. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you. That's very good.